So I'm very honored this morning that we have uh, wonderful uh, members of St. Paul's Parish, uh, Oscar and Marion Johnson, who have agreed to be part of our clergy conversations. And I'm especially fond of this couple because they invited me to their 60th wedding anniversary and it was a Zoom party. And it was a lot of fun uh, being a part of your friends and your family. And it was very unusual that, you know, for everybody that we're doing all this Zoom stuff. So I'm really delighted uh, that uh, you guys have agreed to do this and you're looking good. And <laughs> Arian, you just had a hundred people drive by your door to celebrate your birthday. The yeah. other day we had pictures and happening. So happy birthday to you. So my question, my first question is, uh, 60 years of marriage, right? And yes, show me pictures of when you guys first met. So, so is what's what's your secret? What what's the secret of having uh, living with the same person without killing them? Uh, for 60 <laughs> years? Well, the basic things we had the same core values. We had believed in education, hard work, and family was at the core of the center of everything we did. We both came from very, very supportive families, and um, that was the role model. And uh, our families circled the wagons to protect us from a lot of the racism and a lot of negativism that we didn't feel as much during that period of time. It, although it was in the culture, our families kept us warm and nurtured. Right, honey? Oh, yeah. Yes, that's true. Uh, we both grew up in the church. Oscar's um, father was a Baptist minister. I was a part of the Episcopal Church, St. Simon's, the Cyrenian down in South Philadelphia. And our community, our church, and uh, surrounded us. And we both enjoyed school. Oscar was an excellent athlete. I did dancing and music. And uh, we saw the joy in life and the value in life. And we came from families that uh, supported those core values from the beginning and uh, moving through uh, the Great Migration, everybody reached for education. Now so, you know uh, one thing already, who runs the family? Who runs the family? <laughs> we run the family. That's great. But I love that. So, so the church was always a part of your lives. And Oscar, I didn't know you were a preacher's kid. My, my condolences. <laughs> I didn't know you were a preacher's kid. My condolences. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's true. Mm -hmm. um, so how, how, did you, uh, how did you end up at St. Paul's? I know Oscar, I think Oscar, you came first, right? Yes. Tell them how we came to St. Paul's. Well, I came to St. Paul, I just came for salvo reasons, country reasons. I just like, I could feel it, the, The warmth. Warmth, yes. Yeah, you would go in just to meditate, just to sit yeah. in the church. I could just sit in the back, and which I did. Uh, and I didn't stay for service. I just stayed for my own, and that was my own kind of uh, life. And I, I felt very comfortable there. And that's why I used to come and just sit in, in the back. And when the services start, I left. Yeah, okay. And you came home? Oh, I came home, yeah. Came home. But uh, came I didn't write Marion into it until I was pretty well in uh, comfortable. Yeah, that I was comfortable, and uh, and I was very quickly, and then I start coming every Sunday, Sunday or before, and uh, I, I felt everything was warm. So and and I guess our our music program 
even then was pretty extraordinary and and you just loved the music I, you love the remember music you and i talked about that yes i i loved the music i loved the the organist at that time and i would eventually always make sure i was there in time to hear him or her the music yes. <laughs> That's great. Um, That's wonderful. Then you came home and you said what to me? Uh, yeah, I said to Marion, I, I, I want you to come, it's very, and I explained to her how I felt. And then <laughs> her, her reaction was that, uh, I don't know if we're welcome there. I don't know, it's white. Too white and too rich. Yeah. <laughs> That's the way she felt about it. And I told her, I said, well, if you don't feel good about it and you don't think God is not there, then you shouldn't be there. And she said, and then I finally said to her, listen, I've been going there and God is there. And that's how I said it to her. That's well, wonderful. the rest is history. <laughs> and how many years ago was that now? How long have you been uh, members of St. Paul's? John Francis. When John Francis was there, I think it's about 15 years or more. Oh, yeah. But John Francis was the, the pastor there at the time. Oh, yes. And he, he, he had a, a son, mm -hmm. a, a young kid, a young boy. And we had one at that time. We, had, we were raising our grandson we at the were time. Raising our grandson. And they was, those two got together. We didn't put them together. They got together. They found each other as friends. And they, they found each other as friends. And they enjoyed all the, the youth activities. So we've had a wonderful youth program at St. Paul's. Uh, uh, my grandson talks about it now when they went down to Puerto Rico to. Uh, care for the children who had been abandoned once their parents died from, you know, were going through the ep uh, epidemic of AIDS at the time. But they went every summer, just like we go to Standing Rock now. So that was a, a key part of uh, the strength of the church, the youth program. Right, that's great. And, uh, so tell me, over those um, you know, 60 years of marriage, back to that wonderful journey that you're sharing with us, and it's good that St. Paul's is a part of that, but. What are some of the changes that you've seen? I mean, you talked about how your family values, you know, protected you from the racism. Mm -hmm. And and so what what are you seeing that's changing uh, that's really good right now? And what are the things that are just the same? Well, we were a part of the civil rights movement back in the 60s. We were demonstrators and our uh, my family was very involved with the AME Church, and that's how I, we both, I ended up at Wilberforce, uh, Ohio, because um, the African American Episcopal Church had Wilberforce University there. And then the state uh, of Ohio separated uh, because of uh, the church and state would no longer support religious-based schools. Central State was started as an outgrowth of that. And we were um, strengthened by uh, knowing our history and who we were, and were able to go out uh, and feel good about ourselves where we didn't always have to face or, or prove we were worthy of. Uh, now, we thought we were past that. Now we feel like we're back again. We thought we'd made a lot of growth uh, during that period of our lives. Um, and it's you know painful for us for us to see what's happening again with um, self-identification, with the Black Lives Matter, with um, the institutional racism that still exists. You know, we thought we'd made great gains. And I guess just below the surface, uh, there were others who hadn't accepted those gains or they never let go of their original feelings. Well, one of the things that I like about the church was it's a mixture of, Diversity. Kind, of kindness. And I see that every time I come to church. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
I just feel like... You think that's a big change? Pastor Albert wants to know if that's been a change in our lives, more openness in churches, because Dr. King used to say the most segregated hour we had was the well, 11 yeah. o'clock hour on Sunday. Well, that's true too, but that's yesterday. I think the churches have changed tremendously. A lot of them. Some well, I haven't, the ones that I have been mm -hmm. affiliated with. So uh, you have to give each person its own, its own feeling. And, and, and I, I just think that one of the things that I always looked at was that I always saw Jesus in the church. And I always felt comfortable in the church. Okay. I always felt like the welcome, for instance, uh, I know in your own self that you have us here and you are seeing us here. That wouldn't happen 10 years ago. Maybe not even throughout five years ago, mm -hmm. but it has happened now. Mm -hmm. It's made, I think it's made the church stronger. Yeah, yeah. Well, the two of you, you know, what, what, I, what I really admire about both of you, in both in the business world, because Oscar, you got many awards um, mm -hmm. as a kind of on entrepreneur. You've worked in he Africa was. and... Mm -hmm. And Mary, as a teacher, you were out there doing all this stuff and, and yeah. recognized and so on. So I want to I want to hear about that. How what what was that like as African Americans who were kind of you know making new building new relationships in mm -hmm. in in Africa and around the world? What was that like? Right. Well, when we came back and we were hired by Abington School District, we were thrilled. Um, Little did we know, we were trailblazers there too. I think I was either the first or second African-American teacher assigned to the building I had. And uh, Aventon was progressive. They looked for uh, diversity even then. And it was a strong um, community-based school. We had some issues uh, with race, race relations, but it was a uh, very progressive environment. They had high expectations for all of their students. They had high expectations for all of their ch uh, teachers, and they gave us opportunities to grow. Um, I went to Penn to get my principal certification because of my superintendent. He wanted us to be the uh, best that we could be. And um, Oscar had tremendous opportunities after, he, and Norristown High School was also progressive, but he learned or, or had experiences because of his sports background. You wanna talk about your sports background? Uh, that puts you in places? Well, one, one of the things that I had and, and was in the uh, Olympics programs. And um, one of the things that made me thankful and very thoughtful was the mere fact that I had an opportunity we had, for instance, a little small town like Norristown and, and Allentown. Allentown where I was born, Norristown where I grew up. But it was very, very good at that time. I didn't know anything about segregation in Allentown. I never knew anything about it. But I was very quickly learned when I went to Philly, <laughs> when I went to, I learned what it was all about. And when I went, especially in the military, mm -hmm. and it was good for me. And they were good for me and very honest with me. 
I, so I didn't see. You I got to travel. Yeah. Well, I got to travel all over the world. I always just thought it was Norristown <laughs> at, at that rate. But sometimes I was able to separate bad from what's good. And that means to me, I didn't know that there was such a thing as white people doing bad to black folks. I never knew of that. So you went to mm -hmm. Montgomery? Till I went to Montgomery, Alabama. And I learned very quickly. But the military recognized that and made me separated. And uh, I learned from that. And I learned a lot in the military. I learned how to behave in the military. I learned how to treat myself and my friends and my family. Mm -hmm. And all of that has been very helpful to me. And when we were just talking about the churches and all that, with the, uh, and, I, and our church now, my thoughts have always been God was with me wherever I go. But your military experience plus your education gave you the opportunity to be an entrepreneur when you were able to go to Africa and, well, and to be a writer, to explore your writing experiences. Well, yeah, well, military did all of that. They gave you a background. They gave me a background. And then at Central State, you got the other tools. But the difference though, Marion, you have to learn how to use your background. Mm -hmm. And I had friends that taught me friendship. Right, but that, how did that help you when you are, were, um, one, brokering for crude oil in Nigeria, and two, when you came back to continue your writing? Well, you know, well, it was good. I can, all, I, I can say one thing. And I, I can say this, and I can say to anybody, like, a marriage is good with Marianne. It is good if you let it be good. Mm -hmm. It is always there for goodness. And I was lucky in that respect that I had such a wife that actually helped me grow up. Yep. And helped me see God good okay another one oh. albert <laughs> so you want you want that's great no you guys are great together you've been you've been through through it all together and and it's remarkable inspirational mm -hmm. so i want to go back to your point oscar about the writing because a lot of people don't know that you were a poet from a very early age you started writing poetry mm -hmm. when you were very young and you became a very accomplished um, writer, and some of your friends are even famous. I know I'd love to meet Elton John, and he's a friend of yours. So tell us that <laughs> journey of from poet Norristown to Elton John. Oh, that's, do you want me to help you tell that story? Want me to help you with, remember it? His, I, re I remember all of that. Well, <laughs> his, good friend is Dick, his good friend from high school, I mean, from Norristown growing up, was Dick Butera. And Dick Butera was the owner of Philadelphia Freedoms, the first, when they first uh, started team tennis. And he was a good friend of uh, um, King, uh, what's her first name? Bill, no. Billie Jean, Billie Jean King. Billie Jean King. Billie and Jean, then, yeah. yeah, and Billie Jean King was a good friend of Elton John's. So the Freedoms needed a theme song. 
So uh, Billie Jean said, well, let me see what Elton can do. And as an outgrowth of that, she got Elton John to write Philadelphia Freedoms for the Freedoms, for the, the team tennis. And we were very involved with Dick because of his friends. And we were in awe that we were in the company of Billie Jean King and Elton John. And that's how we met Elton John, right uh, down at the, um, I guess well, it was the arena at the time was the stadium that they were using. And um, through that relationship from Dick Butier owning the Philadelphia Freedoms, uh, Billie Jean King being a star and a myriad of other tennis stars, and they were then in, in the um, aura of people like um, uh, Elton John, and that's how we met them. A lot of people don't know that uh, Philadelphia Freedoms was not written for the city itself. It was the theme song for the uh, team tennis. And in fact, we just talked to Dick because Dick and I share the same birth date, August 26th. So if we don't talk to each other any other time, we kind of reach out and say, happy birthday, glad that we're all doing well. That's great. And so what about the musical, Oscar, that you wrote? What about your musical? Ouch. Uh, well, mm -hmm. That was the result of uh, uh, You always had the right, you always were writing. I was always, yes, I was always writing. And, uh, and I was writing, and Dick and Marion helped me a lot in that field and I would and I could be myself. You were raised with gospel music and you wanted to use gospel music in another genre. Yeah. And I don't think at that time there'd ever been a musical written with gospel music that, you know, was a part of um the Broadway scene or a musical theater at the time. So he had such a respect for gospel music. He felt the stories that he wanted to tell that reflected life's experiences and friends in his childhood and his mother and, and family and how uh, they managed to um, survive in uh, difficult times. He thought it would be a, a good genre to, to introduce to the, the musical world. And that's what he did because of his love for gospel music also, which was an integral part of his life. And uh, launched the first to our knowledge, the first gospel music that uh, went all over the United States and then into uh, to London. And would you believe it? We have a revised version right now that's playing on YouTube. One of the okay. songs, my nephew, my nephew, who was a part of the original musical 50 years ago. And yeah. then we, we then another person who was involved in it brought it back to Atlanta five years ago, four years ago. Yeah. And now right now, they took some of the songs that really had um, captured the, the uh, theater going at the time and updated them. And the latest one is called uh, Freer Than Me. I'll bring you one of them. You can hear, and they're putting a video behind it right now. So for 50 years, we've been in and out of this musical in many uh, different formats. So here we are again, using the latest uh, uh, platforms for showcasing music and videos on uh, YouTube. One of the things I want to uh, point out, the music and my writing was secondary to what I thought about things, what I had to do about things. And one of the things that I, I knew that my friendship with people, and it seems like to me all of them were, especially Dick, Dick Butier, and I mention him often. And the reason why is I, high school, he and I went together for the prom. I took my friend Same. at mm -hmm. that time, and he took his friend at that time. And he comes up with this big Cadillac. Big car. <laughs> big car. And I said, what's that? Whose car is that? 
and it was his dad's car that he gave us to take our dates. Well, first thing, I didn't have a penny, <laughs> no. not a nickel. And uh, so Dick said, oh, okay, let's, get, let's go together. I mean, he bought his date and I brought mine. And I said to him, he took me to Charlie Ventura's in New Jersey. I never knew what a hundred dollar bill looked like. <laughs> I didn't, I just didn't know it. And I said, Dick, how he wanted to pay for everything. And, and I said, I don't have that. I whispered because I had a, a girl that I didn't. I'm trying to impress. Yeah. <laughs> 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 I had it, I said to him, what do you, I kept banging my head and trying to get his attention to go to the lavatory, to the toilet, so I could tell him, I don't have no money like that. <laughs> so he said, don't worry about it, don't worry about it. I'll take care of it. He kept shaking his head, and when I went out there, mm -hmm. he brought this card out. American Express card. Now I know what they are. But back then you did. Back, back then I had no idea what it was. And I kept doing my head like this, shaking my head, trying to tell him, I don't have no money. I don't have no So he said, don't worry, don't worry, don't worry. So finally, yeah. he pulls out the card. But we need to answer the question. What he's saying is his friendships and the values that he had and they encouraged him and he had this uh, desire always to write. So whatever he was doing when he needed to relieve stress, he would go in, and write, keep a notebook. And then finally he had the opportunity to publish his poetry and then to uh, produce Little Willie Jr.'s Resurrection. He has about five or six other scripts that never got uh, developed or produced, but uh, the writing skill was always there. And in fact, when he was teaching at uh, uh, Glenside Weldon, I'm, I'm not sure if it was fifth or sixth grade, he taught the, the, the students uh, how to use their reading in, in another format. So they produced a film. They wrote the script, they produced the film, and the parents could not be more ha happy because the basal reader was not challenging their reading. But when they had to research and write and develop their own scripts, they were excited about it. So they did it at a play. And then we had one of those old, I guess at 35 millimeter cameras, you know, and he filmed it back then. So he was able to intersperse his writing wherever he went. And when he was traveling all over, he could go um, airplanes or downtime when between Africa and Europe, he would go back to this, this writing. And then we got introduced to um, the West Side, you know, the, um, the theater district in London, and it all kind of uh, began to build on life's experiences. And he came back and said, I'm gonna try this again. And he did. So Little Willie has lived with us for uh, nearly 50 years from its uh, beginning, probably before then when he was just taking music and notes notes down. But it's life's so it's experiences. Come back now. Yeah, yeah. So what do you make of all this? Uh, you, you know, you talked about uh, technology and we, you know, we're here yes. we are Zooming. So that's yes. all extraordinary. And even with COVID, we're, we're learning new ways of communicating. How, yes. How's that affecting the way we are and connecting with each other musically, writing, all that? Um, we can connect with the world just instantly, you know. Uh, uh, um, we're getting my nephew because he's on more uh, in tune to following up with everything on YouTube and he brings it to us so he sends the link to me that it's just amazing that the world is instantly connected. Before we had to physically get there, uh, hope that somebody would listen to you, but the uh, 
the instant uh, ability to connect with a myriad of cultures and find things that we all like and enjoy is just amazing. There are some downsides to the technology, but I think there are more upsides that will, for places in uh, remote places like Africa, I'm, I'm assuming, uh, hoping that um, computers that just can run off uh, sun-based cells or batteries, that we'll be able to educate the entire world without having to move even from uh, the, you know basic villages and, and hovels to discover, to communicate, to find out our likenesses instead of our differences and have more humanity for uh, the myriad of cultures that we're sharing. So what about, you know, we've been using technology at St. Paul's in a new way. So what's your, mm -hmm. how do you think we're doing? I think you're doing a wonderful job. I enjoy the, before we could come back to the, uh, you know, small services, I look forward to uh, the, uh, church services and how you interspersed past experiences and incorporated them to what we're doing. We can really concentrate on the sermon and reflect on it in our daily lives. Uh, I think it's been a wonderful way to keep us all connected so you don't feel so isolated. Um, and, and the meetings we've been able to conduct, I think, um, very uh, fruitful meetings in, in, in our search now for a new, uh, new pastor. One of the things that I think about, and I want other people to take this in consideration, is that when we couldn't have Martin Luther King, we couldn't have uh, the car, the music that we have today. We couldn't have had a black president if everybody didn't vote for him, vote for him, black and white. And people have to understand that. So it technology is, has helped us in that, in that right. manner, that we get to know each other personally. Yeah, and that's right. Our warts, uh, as well as our stars, and uh, uh, technology has helped us to do that. We just don't want it to be manipulated, so they're controlling our thinking. We didn't want to know what's true, what's honest, and. Uh, then we can make our own decisions. Yeah, I think that's we're a really going to be. Better, I think we're going to be a better educated world. I know we right. are. Yeah, yeah. Well, the big decisions coming up for the country and and also for St. Paul's. And so my final question to you about yes. uh, St. Paul's is, you know, what is it that you're hoping um, as we? Uh, what, what are the qualities that you're going to be looking for in a new pastor? Um, someone who's going to embrace diversity. Uh, as someone who's going to build and maintain the qualities that have always been St. Paul's, the music background, the family background, but also step out and not um, take on some more of the challenging issues, not be uh, afraid to step up and step out and uh, face some of the conflicts and be, be a leader in that field for diversity, uh, for police brutality, how to reach uh, underserved populations, what to do about some of the drug culture that is still uh, plaguing us. And uh, also one of the missions that I always supported with Cliff was to end homelessness and hunger. And I think it's all intertwined there. Um, make more political statements when necessary. Uh, support the, under the school system so that we're not um, divided by Charters and public schools. I think charter schools and private schools are wonderful, but I think there should be more of their funding should be come from corporations and not being taken away from the public schools. Because when I grew up in the Philadelphia public schools, we had a terrific education. We had uh, art, we had music, we had phys ed, we had orchestras, we had phenomenal sports teams and uh, health departments, you know, health curriculums. Um, uh, field trips and to take that away from public school children because they have to divide their uh, funding between charters and public schools, I think it's not appropriate. One of the things that I always want to emphasize in, in, in this, when I was in Alabama doing the bus boycott and all of that, and I uh, was stationed at Maxwell Air Command and Staff College. I 
I was the only black at that time, at that unit. unit. And I was walking down the street in Dexter, in Alabama, Dexter Avenue. And I bumped into this young white lady, girl. And when that happened, there was a white gentleman, I call him a gentleman, he doesn't know that. Person, yeah. Uh, bump, she bumped into me and uh, he took his cane and walloped me behind my back. In your uniform? I was in the uniform at the time. And uh, he, the young white girl, lady, said, oh no, I bumped into the damn nigger. Now, I had to say it as she did it. And what happened to me then, well, all of them are not bad. Well, she said that in order to save you. Because she said it like, oh, don't do nothing, don't worry about it. He bumped into, meaning me, mm -hmm. bumped into the damn, the damn nigga. That's how it was said. I understand that. All right? Now, I took that as a compliment. Now, because she actually saved you. She saved me. Mm -hmm. She saved me. By saying that, she said, I bumped into the then curse word, nigga. That's how it was said to me. Well, then the guy, police came and said, all right, you go, go on, go on. Told you to go back to the base. Right. She winked at me to let me know that she was saving me. Mm -hmm. I understood that. Mm -hmm. How did I understand that was because my mom taught me how to forgive. Mm -hmm. okay. And I understood what she was saying and said it that way so that they wouldn't harm me. Mm -hmm. She was just as good as me. Mm -hmm. okay. And that's how I, I learned how to look at okay. the goodness of people. Yeah. And we are very proud parents of a loving daughter, Paige Johnson Anderson, a grandson, Kellen. Brian Anderson and a great grandson, Jada Anderson. And we see how life has changed for them. And, uh, but even at that, I worry about my grandsons because I believe they're targets on African-American young men's backs. So uh, we're hoping we, you know, we pray for them and we pray that um, violence isn't the answer that we can communicate more in a humane and a loving manner. So uh, those experiences of still living in fear because of the color of your skin still exist. And with all the gains that we've made, and I applaud the gains that, that I've made, and we've made with opportunities to be entrepreneurs, to be educators, to be in a broader world, um, we just, uh, it's painful to see some of the steps backward moving backward, but we're looking for a, a brighter future. And uh, we have tremendous faith in uh, this country and we believe that our constitution will um, survive even under the most trying circumstances that we live through right now. So I wanna thank you both for um, 
all that you represent in terms mm -hmm. of uh, being pioneers and mm -hmm. um, good, faithful uh, Christians and members of our, our church. I mean, so proud of you. And, you. and you're going to stay on because we're going to have a Q&A with other members of the congregation that will oh, watch this and oh, uh and uh we're we're but we're both very proud of you and again congrat many congratulations on that wonderful birthday thank and you. Uh, many blessings on the 60 years that you've journeyed together you're an inspiration thank you god bless